The managing director of Nigerian Post Authority, MPA, Mohamed Belo Koko, clocked 100 days in office last week. Why no formal event was organized to commemorate it? The day coincided with the commissioning of the ultra-modern MPA training school located on Dokia Road, Papa Lagos. Nigeria's President Mohamed Wari approved the appointment of Belo Koko as the substantive Managing Director of the MPA on February 15, 2022. Since becoming the Managing Director of Nigerian Post Authority, Mohamed Belo Koko has reiterated the organization's commitment to eliminate systemic corruption and other criminal practices at the nation's seaports. Joining us now on this show this morning in celebration of his 100 days in office is Mr. Mohamed Belo Koko, Managing Director Nigerian Ports Authority, MPA. Congratulations. Thank you. Good Once morning, again, everybody. on your confirmation as a substantive MD of the MPA uh, earlier this year. Uh, but let me ask you, what will you say you have done differently uh, in the last 100 days since you assumed office? Um, good morning, Ruben. Good morning. Um, let me first of all use this opportunity to thank the President, uh, Mohamed Bahari, for confirming my appointment as the Managing Director of Nigerian Post Authority and also Right Honorable Rotimi Amiti for making that recommendation. Uh, in the last uh, 100 days or so, uh, what we have done was to, first of all, improve stakeholder engagement. Uh, the first thing we did was to sit down and look at what are the low-hanging fruits, what can we do quickly to improve efficiency in the port and uh, other activities in the maritime sector. Um, we had, first of all, come out with uh, reform initiatives. These initiatives are geared towards, first of all, improving efficiency, geared towards growth in the maritime industry, especially in the Nigerian Post Authority. Uh, we ensured that uh, cost was reduced as much as possible, administrative costs were reduced. And then we worked towards plugging leakages and improving uh, um, uh, revenue. And because of that, we also have been able to uh, transfer over 45 billion in the last four days, I mean in the last four months, to the Consolidated Revenue Fund. And after this 45 billion, about 26 billion happens to be for the year 2022. And then secondly, um, we also ensured that we improved um, debt recovery. We had realized that there was need for us to ensure that we are paid properly and on time for every service that we offered, and so we improved our debt recovery efforts, and that actually helped in ensuring that uh, we transferred more to the Consolidated Revenue Fund. We had also paid more attention to staff welfare and training, and just like you just mentioned uh, recent, I mean it shortly, um, we had um, commissioned a training school in our dockyard. The training school has the capacity to train about 380 persons at any given time. Uh, it's equipped with uh, modern teaching facilities. It has accommodation for over 30 persons at a time. It has a canteen. Uh, it also has a kitchen, a gym, and so on and so forth. And we are going into partnership with training institutes. The training institutes um, are supposed to provide a proper training that would help our people achieve the mandates of Nigerian Post Authority. And then apart from that, we have also tried to make sure that the Eastern ports come back to life. The first thing we did was to get a FEC approval for remedial dredging of um, uh, worry ports uh, up to the Escravos bar. The remedial dredging is about 80% concluded currently. And we've started the mapping and surveying of the channel in Delta Port also. That has not been done for probably over a decade. So we are surveying from the fairway boy to Wari Port, and then from the fairway boy to Sapele and uh, Coco Port. The essence here is to enable us to take a decision on how to dredge that channel and uh, also find where there are uh, uh, um, logistic bases, what do they need, what is the dredging at those areas, what is the draft also. And then over time also we realized in the last uh, few months there was need for Nigerian Post Authority to work with the federal government in encouraging and expanding the non-oil sector and exports. And 
Uh, for that to that, we have licensed about 10 export processing terminals. The export processing terminals are located within Lagos, Ogun, Ondo State. These are supposed to be one-stop shops that uh, exporters will be able to bring in their export products, process them, label them, tag them, containerize them, and take them straight to the ports. We believe this will reduce the waiting time in terms of processing of exports out of the country. Um, in terms of staff welfare, we are also renovating uh, virtually all the dilapidated uh, administrative blocks. Uh, the one in uh, Delta Port has commenced, the one in Tinkan uh, also has commenced, and a couple of other port locations. So what we have done here, you can see, we are trying to refocus the Nigerian Post Authority to improve efficiency. We have also begun the process of full automation of all our processes. We currently have the Oracle e-business solutions, where you have the Oracle Financial, Oracle Hyperion, and Oracle Budgeting. But there is need for us to automate all other processes. So we got the IMO, that's the International Maritime Organization, to consult for Nigerian Post Authority towards deployment of what we call a port community system. The port community system is not uh, an avenue or is not uh, an IT solution that will do away with, say, e-customs and other IT platforms that other stakeholders have. But it's supposed to be a platform that every other person can plug in. The IMO has come up with a regulation and requirement for all ports to automate fully by 2025. We have set up a target for ourselves for 2023. And uh, the IMO is funding some of this. Uh, the first phase was done virtually and it has been concluded. And on Monday this week, the IMO consultants visited Nigeria. They are currently in Lagos. What they are doing is on a spot assessment. The on the spot assessment will take 10 days, after which they will go and come back again. And that part, the final part of it, will be funded by Nigerian Post Authority. On their return, they will visit every port in Nigeria. Currently, they are holding meetings at MP headquarters, but they are visiting offices of Nigerian Customs. They will visit the Nigerian Immigration and other stakeholders just to see what kind of IT deployments do these agencies of government and stakeholders have. That way, they will be able to develop a port community system that will be robust, all-encompassing, and that will bring everybody on board. And eventually, that might be the catalyst or the foundation that will lead to the deployment of a national single window, which is a requirement in the modern maritime world for uh, trade facilitation and ease of doing business. So these are some of the things we have done uh, in a couple of uh, months not necessarily 100 days, like you said, but um, yes, and uh, we'll keep doing more. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what's your appraisal of the electronic call-up system in Lagos? It's been operating for a year. Are there areas you're thinking you might tinker with, or are you considering an alternative application? Um, so, as you're aware, the truck call-up system was deployed to automate the, uh, uh, the manual manifest system of trucks. and. Um, we believe that it has improved traffic flow and reduced gridlock, especially around the Apapa area. Um, yeah, but we have been tweaking it. What we've been doing is holding meetings uh, every week. There are meetings on a weekly basis, two times a week. And uh, the essence here is to look at what are the problems, where do we tweak it, and that tweaking and changing of an improvement in the e up system, which is ETO, has actually improved traffic flow. But we believe there is need to also introduce competition. And competition brings in efficiency. Stakeholders have been pushing for unbundling of the truck call-up system. Uh, we are working on that, and uh, we'll see how that goes. But we believe it is time to do that also. So that we'll also expand it to other ports. Our airport is becoming extremely busy, and we believe it is time to deploy the truck call-up system there also. All right. Uh, you've been very passionate about development of ports, you know, in the eastern operational flank of the IPA. Perhaps the worst is, you know, the Potakot ports. And, you know, is there any hope as regards rehabilitation? And, and also, you know, any hope for rehabilitation as regards, you know, the terminals, I should say. You know, Lagos Terminal, for instance. You know, all the terminals around these areas. Yeah, so the, the river port, I think that's what you're calling the Potakot port. Um, there was a concession in 2006 given to Boa. 
uh, Boa is supposed to have reconstructed some of the belt, and that was not done, and um, some of them have collapsed. But in the past uh, few months, um, we have sat down with Boa, and um, we have requested that they bring up their final designs, which they have done. Those designs are being reviewed. They brought the first interim uh, designs, and we had made observations, and uh, we had reservations on some of the issues and some of the designs. But they have corrected that. They have submitted the final design, and we are working on it. I believe within the month of June, we'll give we the final approval to start reconstruction of uh, reverse port. However, he has also been proactive. And um, I'm happy to say that he had already mobilized materials to site and some of the equipments in anticipation of this approval. So we'll ensure that he gets that approval as quickly as possible. And I'm sure once um, we do that, he will start uh, uh, reconstruction. Um, for the other port locations, let me take up uh, Tinkan, for instance. We all agree and know that Tinkan um, has reached probably its end of life cycle and it needs uh, total reconstruction. What we have been doing in the past is remedial works. And we now believe that it's no more tenable, it's no more economical. What we need to do is to do a holistic and full reconstruction of Tinkan. We have sat down with the terminal operators to discuss ways to rehabilitate it. And there are many options. The first option is, first of all, get a holistic design. Rather than allow the terminal operators to individually reconstruct their birth, uh, we believe it's better to have a full a, and a complete design so that MPA takes a decision on how to do that. Now, the first option is for Nigerian Port Authority to fund reconstruction of Tinkan Island Port. The current estimate is over $600 million to reconstruct Tinkan at the existing birth. Now, how do you fund it? Uh, we have been proactive to, first of all, start looking for funding options. We started having discussions with multilateral funding agencies that will fund this reconstruction. The other option is to go to government and request that Nigerian Post Authority be allowed to use a certain percentage of the funds it is transferring on a yearly basis to the Consolidated Revenue Fund in order to fund the reconstruction of Tinkan. Uh, we transfer between uh, 60 or so billion every year. So if government could approve 40 or 50 percent of that amount to be used for the construction of ports, we believe we do not need to borrow actually. The other option is to do a hybrid funding where MPA funds part of it and then we get multilateral agencies to provide funding for another percentage of it. The final option is for terminal operators to fund this reconstruction. But the issue here is it's not all the terminal operators that have the same financial capacity or will be able to source funds at the same time. You don't want a haphazard uh, reconstruction process. You don't want Terminal A to start reconstruction, Terminal B hasn't started, and then Terminal C starts. It could affect the integrity of the belt. So this has to be properly coordinated. Working with the Federal Ministry of Transportation, this decision is being taken. And it has to be taken at the right time and properly. Um, I have read and have heard people saying the tin can port is collapsing. Let me state here that there is no imminent collapse of the tin can port. But yes, there are defects when it comes to the keys and there have been remedial works, but we are now taking immediate action and very soon you will hear about it. But we need to go to the Federal Executive Council first of all to get approvals. Uh, you even have to advertise, but what we have done now is to get the conceptual design and then uh, eventually you get the final design and the proper uh, final detailed BOQ. For the other ports, in terms of reconstruction, Delta port we know the main problem is the breakwater. The breakwater has collapsed over 10 years ago and it was not reconstructed. What we have done was to engage a firm to do bathymetric and other studies and that's Royal Hasconi. Royal Hasconi had already done the first two uh, um, 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 surveys, they have come up with their results, they are not doing the final one. The final one should be a design of the breakwaters. The initial estimate is that the breakwaters will cost over $200 million, so that's probably a national project. But for us to get Delta Port working, we need to ensure that that breakwater is reconstructed. It's over eight kilometers long in the high sea, so you can see that it's a physical structure that needs uh, very good technical uh, competence in order to reconstruct it. Um, but um, we will do whatever it takes to ensure that these pots are actually working and come back to life. 
Apapa Port 2, we are thinking of reconstructing it. Um, there are failures there, but they are minor. But it's better to reconstruct all the ports um, that actually have defects. Um, there have also been need or requests for us that when we reconstruct these ports, currently the ports in Lagos are between 13 and 14 meters. We should reconstruct to 16 meters. But the problem with that is that the cost of dredging the channel to meet the 16 meters is over $130 million, the initial estimate. So you need to look at also, uh, would you want to deepen that channel and have a seaport, a deep seaport uh, in Lekki, I mean, sorry, in uh, Tinkan and Apapa, where the land mass of the port is not going to increase. This, the same road size is the same one road into Apapa, into Tinkan, uh, whether you bring bigger vessels or smaller vessels. So these additions are being taken in conjunction with the Federal Ministry of Transport. And we believe that shortly uh, a final decision will be taken and will go to the Federal Executive Council for necessary approvals. Well, how about the uh, Calabar port? Is that part of your work plan too, the dredging of uh, Calabar port? Since uh, the plan is to make sure that these other ports are as robustly patronized as the ones in Lagos. Um, so for Calabar port, um, well, like we all know, the Calabar port has, has one of the longest channels in the country. From the fairway boy to the port is over 110 kilometers, actually. So it means that if you are going to dredge, you have to dredge the whole of that stretch uh, between uh, the fairway boy to the port. But there was uh, an agreement, there was a contract, a dredging contract, a channel management contract uh, that was in place. However, there was a dispute between the Nigerian Post Authority and the company. Uh, the matter is in court, so it's subsidies. But um, the Federal Ministry of Transport and Ministry of Justice are trying to uh, resolve this out of court so that probably dredging could um, take place there. But we also need to look at the cost of the dredging in Calabar and the likely business opportunities and maritime and marine traffic that will come into that port. This is also one of the things that we are trying to resolve uh, before, the end of the, uh, before the end of this new quarter so that we would uh, probably start the dredging of Calabar and ensure that economic activities begin. Is the MPA also you know, considering a lower tariff regime to attract importers to ports in rivers and delta and what have you? So um, we had, management had initially um, offered tariff relief uh, in some ports, especially in Calabar and some of the eastern ports. But we did that in order to encourage importers or exporters, importers in particular, to use those ports. Uh, however, we realize that the benefit of that um, tariff relief has not trickled down to the beneficiaries, the targeted beneficiaries who are the importers, actually. Uh, we are working on tariff reliefs that will actually trickle down to the importers. Don't forget that uh, the importers are the ones that determine where to bring in their goods. So we believe that if we come up with something that will reduce their own cost uh, as regards to uh, tariffs when they are importing goods into the country, they will use that. And uh, we, we are working on that. We are discussing with the stakeholders and uh, suggestions are being brought up that uh, we bring a tariff that will um, not just benefit the shipping companies, but it will also will ensure that it trickles down to the importers. So shortly that will be implemented. Let's talk about you know, moving freight around through badges. Because, like you said, they're port, obviously one way in and all of that, the traffic gridlock and all that. Mm. And the use of badges can be a very viable means to get freight out. Uh, what is it like? Uh, have you been talking to some badge operators? Uh, what's the conversation like? Are they maintaining safety standards? So, um, while reviewing the traffic gridlock in, um, in Tinkan and Apapa, we realized worldwide uh, the new practice is actually to have an intermodal mode of transportation, multiple tr means of transporting goods out of the port. In Nigeria, we predominantly rely on uh, the road. Virtually 95, if not more, percent of the boxes or imports are coming by road. And it's no more efficient, it's no more effective. And then we introduce the barge operations. But we have now realized that there are so many barges in the waterways that actually do not meet minimum safety standard. Uh, some of them do not have communication equipment. Some of them have pilots that do not have licenses uh, to allow them to actually have those badges. And then um, the badge operations have been turned into more like, okay, today you get 
a, a deal to move 100 containers from one location to the other, you go looking for a badge. So the badges are just there for leasing. So what we have done is to now come up with minimum safety standard, which we have said must be implemented. We will not issue any badge license except you meet our requirements. And then those requirements involve uh, you know, communication equipment. You must be able to label your badge so that when there is any accident or any offense has been committed, we need to be able to identify uh, that badge. And then the pilots must be trained. We are discussing with the badge operators and we thank them so much for um, being there and for also at least listening to reason to understand that we can no more allow some of their activities. Some of them include double banking, uh, you know, operations at night, which we have said need to stop. And very soon we'll introduce a tariff. The tariff here is a new source of revenue to Nigerian Ports Authority and the government. And there, of course, we are maintaining the channels and MPA has to be paid for that. We are providing service. Um, there are discussions ongoing for them to uh, come together. If they need to merge and produce and or procure uh, well-equipped badges that are safe for usage in the in the channels, we have asked them to do that and we'll support them in any way. So yes, that discussion is in place and we believe that um, the badge operators understand that we are doing this in the interest of the country, not necessarily uh, because we want to do it, but because we have to do it. It's, it's, it's necessary that that is done. Well, I mean, you recently renovated, upgraded and commissioned the MPA training school, right? But it's one thing to have the structure in place. What are the plans in terms of Training, how much emphasis do you intend to place on training? And what kind of partnerships are you, you know, looking at? And what are the core benefits are you imagine or you plan to provide through that training school for the maritime community? So um, one of the things we have done is to say that um, for us to have efficiency uh, and growth and so on and so forth, you must have the talent. The talent here, I'm talking about the staff. The staff must be well trained. They must be provided the tools that are necessary for them to perform their responsibility. And that's why we came up with the training school. Like I had mentioned, the number of persons you can train and so on and so forth. But what we have done was to ask our human resource department to come up with a curriculum, a training curriculum for each department and each division. The idea here is to ensure that there are you know, customized trainings get towards each division and each department. But then we are also working towards bringing back some of our retirees, some of our staff that have retired, that are actually good on the job, that are left with high colors, that we know are intelligent and can actually offer training. We want to bring them back, pay them something, not just are we putting money in their pockets, but we're also asking them to bring back uh, the knowledge that they had and teach the junior ones. And that is more like on the job training because they were once on that desk, they were once on that table, and there's no better person to provide that training. Uh, so, and then of course we are liaising with other training institutes. We're already in discussion with ASCON. Uh, we are discussing with the World Maritime University also. We'll be discussing with the Kaduna and Lagos Business Schools. We'll be discussing with them to come and sit down. Uh, Professor Patutomi has been in discussion with us also to come up with a curriculum that will be um, useful to our staff. And uh, we expect that training should commence first week of July. Um, the essence of that training school also is to reduce cost. I'm sorry I keep talking about reduction of cost, but that is really necessary. Instead of us going to hotels and renting halls, I believe that training school, the atmosphere is fantastic, the facilities are good and up to date, world standard facilities. And we'll send our staff there, 380 staff, can be trained at that location at any given time. And uh, that will reduce cost. And then you are able to properly monitor training uh, at one location at a time. Right. The role of IT in the emerging ports dispensation cannot be overemphasized. So what are, what are your plans with regards to ports automation? Um, like I've mentioned initially, I believe, or let me say we believe that one of the most important things that need to be deployed for this uh, port to be efficient is IT. IT, IT and IT. It is really important. What it does, it, it reduces human interference. It improves uh, efficiency. It also plugs leakages. And um, also naturally it will improve uh, revenue. Uh, like I had mentioned, we have um, uh, e-business solutions, uh, Oracle, that um, is geared towards improved revenue collections. But we're about to start 
harbors automation. Our major function here is on the harbors department. The harbors automation here will bring automation from the time the vessel comes to our shores from the fairway boy to bathing of the vessel to you know uh, clearing of the vessel and so on and so forth. And then it also brings interface between our harbors department and other users, whether it is the towage company, whether it is the terminal operator, and so on and so forth. The port community system will be a game changer for us. It will definitely reduce wastages, reduce uh, waiting time of vessels, the dwell time, and then also it will bring efficiency. Uh, it's something that has been deployed all over the world by many ports, but we don't have it in Nigeria, and we believe deploying uh, the port community system will make our ports more efficient and much more competitive also. So we'll do whatever it takes uh, in our 2022 budget. We have made provisions for this and uh, we've made provisions for deployment of more IT tools. But we also have multiple IT uh, tools that are in silos. And uh, what we are doing now is integrating them, bringing them together. Uh, we have RIMS that is on its own. It's been integrated into the Oracle Financial and uh, so on and so forth. So integration of our IT tools also is ongoing currently. All right, I mean, that's a holistic uh, technological move uh, there. But I want to ask about, you know, contracts, you know, for existing contracts, the Intel contract, for instance, also the contracts with the concessionaires, you know, those that are running the terminal. There's been back and forth and discrepancy as regards that. Uh, some of them feel unhappy as, as, as regards the way they've been treated. So can you talk through this and also talk through the Intel contracts? Okay, so the Intel contract, um, currently there is a presidential directive for us to, um, for the Attorney General of the Federation and the Minister of Transport also, to uh, continue with the procurement process that had commenced towards awarding the contract to uh, a set of companies. However, the matter is in court, is uh, subsidies, so one of the instructions given to the Attorney General was also to look at uh, how to get those cases out of court, discuss them out of court, or settle them out of court, let me use that word. Um, so let me just say that that matter is still in court. But currently, the Nigerian Post Authority is carrying on that responsibility of monitoring service boats. And uh, we are the ones monitoring and collecting the revenue that is there. As, it, as regards to the terminal operators, now, the concession agreement was signed 2006. As at the time that was signed, the needs of the country or of Nigerian Post Authority is definitely different from 2022. The requirements as at then are different from now. And we have always agreed that that concession agreement, although signed by government and Nigerian Post Authority, is somehow skewed not in favor of the country. And that's why we are reviewing it. And there was an interministerial committee that was set up between Nigerian Post Authority. We got the World Bank to uh, consult for us, and there was the Nigerian Post Authority, Federal Ministry of Justice, Federal Ministry of Transport, ICRC, BPE, and the stakeholders and the terminal operators, I mean themselves. And in that, we took the concession agreement and looked at it. There is a scorecard. There are things and there are responsibilities of Nigerian Post Authority that Nigerian Post Authority had not been able to fulfill. And on the side of the terminal operators, there are also some of their own uh, there, are, there are some responsibilities of theirs they have not been able to fulfill. There had been the issues of GMT and so on and so forth. What we did was to sit down and review that concession agreement. The essence of reviewing it is so that both parties will come to a certain point of agreement and then we sign it off. After that review, we sent it to the ministry for final approval. Now, incidentally, some of the terminal operators' concessions or leases were about to expire. And we looked at it that most of them were actually in Tinkan. In the initial concession agreement, there was no issue about port uh, physical structure development. And here we are being asked to renew concession of a terminal that is collapsing. And then there is also the need for us to reconstruct it. And we engage the terminal operators to say, listen, what about your development plan? How do you intend to develop this place? How much are you gonna spend? The ICRC Act, ICRC wasn't there in 2006 when the concession agreement was signed. But now there is ICRC and there is an act of ICRC. And the ICRC had initially recommended that we should advertise these um, uh, expired leases and terminals for us to have an international bid. 
But the initial concession agreement also gives the terminal operators the right of first refusal. So you see there's a conflict here. What we tried to do was to sit down and say, you know what? Sit down, the terminal operators bring out an OBC, even if we're not advertising for a new set of bidders, and then an FBC. And looking at the FBC, we required that they need to show us their development plan. How much do you intend to spend on equipments over time? What kind of equipment? How much money are you spending on physical development of the infrastructure? So I was surprised to see one of the MDs of the terminal sitting in this studio and saying what he said. I have a letter from him. The first time we asked terminal operators to get involved in reconstruction of the terminals, the same MD wrote to us saying that he's not interested in reconstruction of the ports. But that means we could have easily found somebody to, who is interested in reconstruction of the ports to come and bid and take it over. But because there is a right of first refusal, so if anybody says MPA uh, is uh, planning to terminate any concessions, it's really not true. What we are doing is to try to get the terminal operators to sit with us to plan the construction of Tinkan Island port and every other port that is collapsing. That way the funding arrangements will be there, the rules of engagement are there, and we ensure that this time around there is a concession agreement that is in the interest of the country, in, of Nigerian, in, in the interest of Nigerian Ports Authority and Nigeria. And we ensure that we hold them accountable. We created a monitoring and, uh, mon a monitoring and regulatory services department that on a quarterly basis looks at the performance of the terminal operators. And there is a template. And we also ask the terminal operators to also assess the performance of Nigerian Ports Authority. And some of them actually give us zero. Some of you with even some eyes and a smiley face on the zero, which we accept. What we are asking, what we are getting here is what? Feedback. It's only when there is feedback that we'll be able to make amends and improve our services. And we expect the terminal operators to hear, understand that what we want is a better port. It will be cheaper for them to operate when those facilities are rehabilitated. We will also want to have a concession agreement that gives MPA the powers it does not have now. Powers to uh, apply penalties properly, powers to monitor them properly, powers to ensure that they have the right equipment uh, that there should be. But let me state here that the initial concession agreement in terms of equipment and what have you, the terminal operators have met those requirements. But what we are asking for now is the terminal operators should allow us to come with a concession agreement that is fair to MPA and Nigeria and Nigerians also. But nobody is planning to terminate any lease agreement. The Federal Ministry of Transport has just given instruction that we should go ahead and continue the review of concession and renewal of concessions. But it should be on the terms that are favorable to Nigeria, on fair terms also. Okay, quickly, let's talk about revenue. I understand that under your watch there's been uh, uh, some improvement in revenue. And everybody says, oh, Nigeria's uh, problem is... Uh, revenue to be able to fund a lot of things. So it's interesting to see an agency like the MPA uh, raking in more revenue. But how do you, how have you done that? And how do you intend to sustain it? So one of the first things we did was to, first of all, improve the collection mechanism here. Um, we, we tightened up leakages and uh, we started holding people responsible. Um, yes, we have always held people responsible, but we are now more, you know, we're putting more eye on that. Uh, we, are hold, we hold regular meetings, monthly meetings, uh, we call them revenue meetings, where each of the uh, port managers will uh, read out their, 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 their revenue generated and revenue collected. And if there's a difference between revenue generated and collected, we want to know why the difference and who is owing MPA. Why have you not collected that revenue? And we've gotten to the extent whereby we've asked terminal, or, I mean, uh, sorry, port managers to actually suspend service to anyone that is owing over a certain time. Uh, yes, we know that there are issues to do with, uh, uh, you know, funding, especially uh, uh, by IOCs, um, but we have told them that, you know what, for as long as you are operating, you need to pay that revenue, uh, that uh, uh, asset when due. So we have seen an increase in payments over time. We have seen reduction in debt or liability, and that has actually increased our revenue over time. So what we have done is to hold port managers and everybody responsible for revenue generation. And we keep looking for additional uh, revenue sources without necessarily increasing the cost of doing business at our ports. And let me state here that um, the last time Nigerian Ports Authority increased its revenue 
It's, I mean, decades ago, over 10 years ago, actually. The only revenue head or tariff that uh, we have um, increased, sorry, I keep saying revenue. The only uh, tariff that we have increased is that of towage. But we have not increased our tariff, not revenue. We have not increased our tariff for over 10 years. So when people are talking about increasing uh, cost of doing business at the port, it's not necessarily associated with the tariffs from the Nigerian Post Authority. So we keep lo uh, looking for ways to plug re revenue leakages, keep looking for new revenue heads also, and then ensure that uh, we keep improving the collection mechanism uh, of our revenue. Right, we've talked about the MPA training school that you recently commissioned, but in more detail, what can workers expect from your administration in terms of welfare and capacity building? Um, for capacity building, they can already see that um, we have a new training school, uh, although I'm sure to, uh, some of them would rather go to um, outside the country for trainings. And then the trainings also, the foreign trainings will commence when we get the necessary approvals. There are some departments that there are trainings, you, they really need to do them offshore, especially the harbors department. But with the bridge simulator, we have some of those trainings will take place there. Um, we are working towards ensuring that um, all the administrative buildings, authority-wide, are rehabilitated. I'm sure the staff can see that we have started that. Uh, we are working with the necessary government agencies to see how we can improve uh, their emoluments also. Uh, the, the, the salaries and wages of the staff in the authority have not been uh, increased at least for over 13 to 14 years. And with inflation and so on and so forth, we believe that it is time we do something about that. We have written to the supervising ministry, which has approved, and that is now with the Salaries and Wages Commission, and we'll keep working to see how that can be worked on. And we have the revenue, we have the budgetary provision to support any increase in staff uh, wages. Um, we are also ensuring that they have the right working tools. Uh, recently, we have rehabilitated the control towers in Tinkan and Apapa. Uh, they have been in a terrible state for a decade or so. They were built in the 70s, but they have just been renovated and furnished properly so that those that need to work there work in an environment that is safe, that is healthy, that is also conducive. We are providing more working tools in terms of their computers, PPEs, and uh, so on and so forth. Recently, we also deployed uh, some marine vessels for use by our marine department, the harbors department in particular, uh, towards ensuring that um, we improve our services. So staff welfare is, um, uh, is, is really key. Happy staff, you know, uh, happy workforce means uh, better productivity, increased uh, revenue and uh, efficiency at the port. And we keep working to ensure that the staff are happy. Right. Uh, we'll, we'll, um, okay, a after this quick question, we'll just uh, take a tease to break. Uh, I'd like to ask you about the blue economy, you know, because we've been talking about diversification along exports and the likes and things like that. You know, what has the MPA done as regards, you know, using the blue economy as a panacea, you know, societal development? economic you know, rejuvenation of Nigeria? Um, <clears throat> so in recent times, there has been a committee set up uh, by the federal government, uh, and the vice president is actually leading that. Nigerian Post Authority, NIMASA, and other agencies of government are part of those that are developing the likely ways to harness the blue economy. We believe the blue economy is vast and untapped in Nigeria, and we are playing a key role in it. Our departments have always been working towards improving the blue economy of the country. There are possibilities that can be harnessed. Working with the right government agencies, uh, we will ensure that this is achieved. But there has to be a roadmap. There has to be a plan. Everything has to have a plan and a roadmap. So uh, government is looking for the low-hanging fruits that can immediately be harnessed, and then eventually there will be a master plan. And uh, the Federal Ministry of Transportation, there's a department there that is representing uh, the maritime agencies in that committee, and we are working closely with them to ensure that this uh, comes to reality as quickly as possible. Okay, just before we let you go, it's been 100 days since you assumed office. Is there going to be a jollof rice and pepper soup party? <laughs> and are we going to be, are we? Eh? Are we Any objections? <laughs> Well, um, actually, uh, this 100 days is not supposed to be max, but yes, that will be jollof rice, but it will be Ghana jollof rice anyway. 
Ghana so. shall not fight at the Nigerian Port Authority. Well, you know why? Because I, I know you reject it, so that means I don't need to buy the jello fries. That's why I said Ghana oh jello fries. <laughs> well, uh, in the next hundred, thank you so much. What we need are prayers and then encouragement and constructive criticism. But there will be no celebrations. Rather, we will just push to see that the next hundred years, I mean hundred days, and the next and the next and the next keep being eventful. We keep achieving our mandates, improving our revenue, improving trade facilitation, which is the full uh, function of an Nigerian Post Authority. And um, I want to thank the executive management and the staff for all their support. Whatever we have achieved could not have been achieved without their support. Well, on that note, we'd like to thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mame Belo Koko, uh, for joining us uh, on the morning show today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much.